Big things rarely start big. Barbie's origins are not mysterious, but they are illustrative of how business works. Come along with me on a journey of the mind. In 1945, very much during a pretty major Second World War you've probably heard of, Ruth and Elliot Handler found Mattel in their garage in Los Angeles with their business partner, Matthew. These first products were making dollhouses out of old picture frames. Mattel's first manufactured product was a ukulele. It was in the late 1950s in Switzerland with her daughter Barbara that Ruth sees a billed lily doll in the window of a shop, which proves to Ruth that a 12-inch doll for girls was possible, a fight she had previously lost with her two business partners, Matthew and Elliot. I tried to convince Elliot that we could make a three-dimensional uh doll and he said it'd be impossible for us to do. She thought it was a good idea and I didn't think it was a great idea because ideal Choi at that time had <laughs> And just to uh, <laughs> real quick, um Mattel, Matthew and Ellie Yeah, that's where Mattel comes from. They just kept Ruth's name out of it. This is further underlined by the fact that her daughter is going nuts for this Bill Lily doll in the window. Dolls for kids in the 50s were either made of paper or grooming you for motherhood. A doll with curves was right out in God's country, but in Germany, Switzerland, Ruth correctly identifies a market for toys in America and changed the fabric of her company by doing so. Proving a market exists to your husband and business partner right as the 60s dons. Oh yeah, that's my shit. Barbie changes the entire toy business in the United States. Good morning, America. Here's a big uh, business spoiler. Tiny children come in all forms with all types of interests. End sentence. Barbie moved the toy market on a dime. Barbie changed everything and has managed to exist as a huge brand for six decades based on a comic having a doll version available at shops in Europe. It is difficult to set something up as generationally massive as Barbie. A Barbie movie makes sense, like a real in theaters Barbie movie. But what would that even look like? How could that even work? She's, a, she's just a product in a box. But the Ninja Turtles origin isn't that far off, so let's just move on. Certainly there have been many attempts at a Barbie movie. So grab a Barbie brand Ken doll, little extra six pack of shoes, and head on over. Today, we're hitting the road. Big things rarely start big. The first time a Barbie movie was considered for production, it was He-Man <laughs> that uh, killed it. More specifically, 1987's Masters of the Universe dog so hard at the box office, Mattel pulled out of their development deal with Canon Films. Sorry, Dolph. Fast forward to 2009, Mattel signs a partnership with Universal Pictures. This pie in the sky Barbie project goes through a Diablo Cody and Amy Schumer and loads of actors, writers, and directors. This thing is rewritten all kinds of times. Schumer exits and Hathaway is involved for a minute. Nothing ever successfully gets off the ground. The rights revert back to Mattel in 2019, who promptly changes the name of their production company to Mattel Films. Clean slate, let's go. More on that later. Enter Margot Robbie and her production company who signs onto the film as star and produce Robbie herself pitches the film to Warner Brothers and respect on a crown where do but did you know? Margot Robbie jokingly suggested in her pitch to Warner Brothers that Barbie is so big that this film will make a billion dollars. 
When I say there is no one but Margot Robbie who could have played Barbie, it's all about the business muscle someone is going to need to make a bombastic and entirely profitable swing at the cultural fences. Robbie subsequently brings on Smash Sensation and director Greta Gerwig, who brings on adjacent Smash Sensation Noah Baumbach to co-write the film with her. Of possible team-ups of cinematic excellence, at a Ryan Gosling, Anissa Rae, a Simu Liu and a Michael Sarah, and you have the makings, and you have the makings of a once in a lifetime cinematic moment. Throw in eight mile cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto, Killers of a Flower Moon, Wolf of Wall Street, Argo, Babel, 21 Grams. He, he, he has a theme, you know, and then, and then, uh, Barbie is now part of that, uh, theme. What this team accomplishes is nothing short of extraordinary. So this episode is talking all about that. Barbie is a 2023 film written by Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach and directed by Greta Gerwig. I've talked about her two previous directorial efforts on this show multiple times. Her adaptation of Little Women should be required viewing. This is a movie about who Barbie ends up being. Uh, also, spoilers for the Mattel film, uh, Barbie's going on a journey, everyone hashtag spoilies. Barbie's arc in this film is misinterpreted by those around her. They, the plastic doll people friends. Hey, this is serious film criticism here. Read Barbie as being obsessed with death when it turns out all she could think about is living. And living a life would include aging and death. And that's the beautiful part. You're so beautiful. I know it. That's costume designer Anne Roth, by the way, the costume designer of Barbie the movie and future 2024 Oscar winner. While we're here, I'll just throw a whole list at you. Anne Roth, the absolute giant of the industry, was the costume designer on Midnight Cowboy, Murder by Death, Dress to Kill, Biloxi Blues, Working Girl, Regarding Henry, The Mambo Kings, The Birdcage, In and Out, The Talented Mr. Ripley, The Village, and that's just me randomly picking titles from a massive list. Look, Barbie was absolutely correct to put respect on the name of Anne Roth. <laughs> Barbie! Barbie just wants to exist, and it is Mattel that keeps trying to put her in a box. What a film. But also, don't read into it. Ooh. Keep making content. Keep making content. Keep making content. You could pretty easily point out that the through line of this movie is that not even being Barbie is enough to survive in the real world. The whole movie hinges on this. What do you want? I don't know. I'm... I'm not really sure where I belong anymore. It's okay to feel complex things while watching this movie. It goes out of its way to make sure you have a great time. Ryan Gosling personally wants you to have the best time. Feel like something's got to give. And I'm a little bit... It is impossible to say they didn't put all of that money on screen for you. You want weird film takes you can't get anywhere else? Greta Gerwig is the Michael Bay of a new generation of filmmaker. Commercial as hell, can deliver blockbusters about childhood obsessions, has great hair, and will photograph the absolute hell out of a scene. Okay, I'm sorry, I could have just said Steven Spielberg hair, which would have made a lot more sense, but anarchy reigns in Barbie land, baby! Let's talk about the impossible miracle of actually producing a, a profitable and well-liked Barbie movie. We've seen some misses in the toy space before, is all I'm saying. This is going to get metaphysical, so wear a helmet or something. Greta and Noah were just going to write a Barbie movie for Margot, their producer. But sometimes when stuff gets down on the page, you just see it. Little Women was a definitive stepping stone as a director to this moment. 
which makes perfect sense. You should be scared if the director of the best Little Women movie, Fighting Words, I know. So who does she marry? You should be terrified. I think it's okay to read into this movie as Greta stepping up to larger things, a thing she was clearly ordained by President Barbie to do. Can a film be both commercial and critical of the product the film is ostensibly advertising? Yes, obviously the answer is yes. The Lego movie showed us that pretty clearly. And here is a Barbie film that canonizes Ooh. earring magic Ken and also questions Barbie's place in the toy god pantheon. It is also well on its way to making a second billion dollars at the box office. I might have buried the lead a little there. A film Mattel produced themselves. It is many things. So let's get all video essay weird with it. As if this movie is almost a Bob Fosse-esque musical that can be 10 things in 10 dimensions. Ken sings the big number at the end of this post, post, post modern film. So film studies with Michael Class, shall we start with a simple question? I'll make it multiple choice. Who is the protagonist of the Barbie movie? Is it A, Barbie, B, Ken, C, Gloria, or D, the juxtaposition of complex cultural film themes also being for-profit brand ventures, which is complicated. Pencils down, pencils down. The correct answer to the question was yes. You could argue it a hundred different directions. I can't wait for dissertations about this to emerge. I want to live in a world where Abed Nadir contemplates this question every hour of every day because while on one hand stereotypical Barbie does in the film transforming from toy into a genuine human being, a real Pinocchio story, if you will. It needs to be argued that Gloria fixes the relationship with her daughter through growth and understanding because her toy comes to life after thinking about death too much. Yo, that's main character shit. Does Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House enter the equation in any way? And before you answer, please do consider Beach. And I guess the gaining of personhood and agency or uh, whatever. It's so many things in so many genres. The correct answer is applause. Truly a movie that doesn't fit into a I See what I did there. Stroll with me, if you will. Set the mood. I'm gonna Cliff's Notes the Barbie movie now. Finally on time to a movie. Hand me all the awards. The movie sets it straight pretty much right out the gate. Barbie, Barbie has, has a great, great day, day every, every day. day. But Ken, Ken only, only has, has a great day, day Barbie, Barbie looks, looks at him. Yeah. The movie is literally framed in these terms, irrefutable pillars of existence as a toy in the Barbie world. Ken just waits for Barbie to need him. But also, Ken isn't really Barbie's responsibility. Ken. You know, Ken, Barbie and Ken. <laughs> yes. Ken, get the guy, yeah. Ken isn't something we're worried about. There's emotions around the subject, in fact. This causes consternation in the Kendom, mostly among themselves, causing little skirmishes and fights here and there. Barbie, who up until now is framed only within the Barbie-verse, a land where it's girls' night every night, has thoughts about death and stuff. This is, of course, because her original owner is experiencing midlife, you know, America shit. So her thoughts are coloring the thoughts of her personal childhood Barbie doll. Stereotypical Barbie death and stuff. This whole movie is about this absolutely ridiculous premise culminating in our understanding of it. Oh, this is a movie for everyone that has ever played with a Barbie. You laugh, cheer, cry, but really it's about what happens when you're laying in bed later that night. Your brain waits for that moment right before you're about to fall asleep and then... Grim looking at her estranged best friend's engagement photos while eating a family-sized bag of Starbursts. And now her jaw is killing her. Is existential torture an inevitable outcome of growing up? Do I torture all of my toys? Oh, God! 
In the movie, Barbie goes to visit the oracle of this land, Weird Barbie. That can of yours. He is one nice looking little protein pot. How deliciously possessive you are, Barbies. Weird Barbie explains the weird don't think about it too much premise that the toys inherit the ennui of their owners. Maybe some thoughts of death? Thoughts of death? My Ninja Turtles were so sad. Stereotypical Barbie is now on a quest to visit the real world and fix the existential terror disaster that is, as we will learn, Gloria, a Mattel employee. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ken, doing a very main character thing, stows away in Barbie's car in her journey to find Gloria in the real world. Also, the travel between the toy world and the real world is 100% scientifically accurate. NASA did this part, in fact. So Barbie and Ken venture out into the world where gender politics are, in a word, different. Different than they were accustomed to in the simplified toy matriarchy. <laughs> And then Ken learns that a system of life exists where it is the men who are defaulted to. Ken discovers uh, patriarchy. Uh oh. Barbie gets captured by Mattel, and Ken absconds back to Barbie Land to spread his newly discovered theology, patriarchy. <laughs> The Kens are taking over Barbie Land because they realize they can, not because they think it will help anything. This is also very important. Meanwhile, Mattel tries to put Barbie in a box and she absolutely refuses. I'm sure there's no metaphor here or anything about controlling the lives of entertainers and celebrities, and let's just move on. It is Mattel, the company, that makes Barbie most afraid in the real world. I wonder what the studio notes on this movie were like. Anyway, Barbie escapes back to Barbie Land where her owner and her daughter just in time to realize that Barbie Land now resembles the real world and her dream house is now a Mojo Dojo Casa house. It's a real bummer all around. So I'm gonna pose a second haunting question and this movie puts this right out in the open. It has haunted me ever since I watched it. Where do the Kens live? The movie poses, but does not answer this question. Are they homeless? Do they just live at the beach? More importantly, within the framework of this film, is that the Barbies are wholly unconcerned with this question. Because little girls are generally unconcerned with this question. Tara said a thing to me after this movie that like haunted me. Kens live under the bed. Of course, Kens feel underappreciated in this universe, but also, and sort of more importantly, they don't do anything. People who shouldn't be in power, forcing themselves into power. Where have I seen this before? Here is a very strange answer to my main character question. Ken is the protagonist in the musical movie, Barbie is the protagonist in the Pinocchio movie, and Gloria is the protagonist in the Mattel family movie. There's like three movies going on, but Ken definitely gets the song from the musical. I'm just Ken. In the end, if you're not sure, just make three movies that exist on top of one another. Cinema doesn't have to change the world, but it can make you reflect on it. Barbie feels like a silly movie that three weeks later you're still thinking about, and that is very much on purpose. Oh, and Issa Rae gets to go back to being President Barbie uh, again. It's like four perfect endings. So after talking about how this movie is amazing, let's go a level deeper. I don't want to alarm anyone. That's all you do. <clears throat> the entertainment world is attempting to become an entirely new thing. Get ready for that Hot Pockets movie and its sequel, Lean Pockets 2. I'm not saying that Barbie has cracks in the ceiling. I'm saying the flimsy house that the entire film industry is building on top of Barbie's success is going up with cracks in the ceiling. It's time to cruise around Malibu and pontificate lovingly on the many influences that land in Barbie, creating an entirely new thing altogether. 
remix the past, create the future. I'm highlighting depth of thought of crowd-pleasing cinematic mastery on display in Barbie to create a result like this. Allow me to use a relevant cinematic influence to our Mattel landscape. And we may not start in the place that you would have predicted. The Truman Show was a wildly influential film to Greta as a director on Barbie, a real-life influence as it turned out as director Peter Weir was happy to jump on the phone with her, which is the coolest thing. Of specific interest to Greta were the Truman scenes filmed around the house. This is a house in a real location, not a soundstage, but they feel so not lit by sunlight. Everything is just slightly wrong, but you get used to it, so then reality becomes the weird thing in The Truman Show. Also, Truman Show is a masterpiece at subverting and distorting reality. And here's the important bit. Turns out Peter Weir would shoot on real locations and then light on top of them diligently to look like sets. He lit real life to look like sets. It's genius. And a helpful piece of advice, as it turned out, filter this ideal through the lens of Vincente Minnelli. Throw in some good, raw-ass American musicals like Oklahoma, you get Barbie. A movie that defies explanation and somehow wears its influences on its sleeves, making real sets look fake in an unnatural way. Brilliant. A subverted and improbably fake reality that becomes so real, actual reality is the thing that becomes weird. Like I said, Greta is doing an actual magic trick on this movie. A movie framed around returning to normal when normal is Barbie land. But you know what they say, you can never go home again, even if you're just a toy. It's true. In fact, comfort for Barbie was girls night every night. Comfort for Ken was singing creepy Matchbox 20 songs with an uncomfortable amount of eye contact to whatever Barbie would listen. And neither goes back. You can't go home again. It's called Barbie, but it's a movie with three distinct storylines worth of main characters taking place on two distinct and interchangeable levels of reality. One that takes every opportunity to remind you that you're watching a love letter to a doll. No. No. Ah! You're Ken. But it's Barbie and Ken. Maybe it's Barbie and it's Ken. Oh, I'm sorry. Does your summer blockbuster not pontificate on the gender politics of dolls that even kids can understand? Quickly, I know there are some people incredibly upset that this movie did not connect with them and wants to make their fifis everyone else's problem. Greta just proved an impossible thing was possible. It's gonna ruin the world of film probably, but damn it, she pulled it off. Making a movie out of a generational childhood toy. Let's go ahead and put that one on top of the difficulty scale, even above video game movie, and move on. Now, if watching this feat of infinite magnitude getting pulled off means your first thought to how do we take everything we do and replicate this success across a field of seemingly disconnected toy thoughts, Allow me to translate. Um, it ain't Marvel when you have to find a seat at the table for Uno. No, that's, that's not a joke. I'm sure no one will learn the wrong lessons from the, what's that? Part five is called what? The year is 2023. All brands are now movies in development. There's literally no way to make a joke here anymore. Beyblades, the movie is inevitable. I've already won. I'm sure we all want to know how bad this is, so I'll just rip the band-aid off. Hold someone close to you, here comes a list. Currently in production at Mattel Films is... Barney, Hot Wheels, American Girl, Big Jim, Chatty Cathy, and Betsy Wetsy, Jesus Christ! Christmas Balloon, Magic 8 Ball, Major Matt Mason with Tom Hanks attached, Matchbox, which is somehow different than Hot Wheels, Polly Pocket, Rockin' Sockin' Robots, Thomas and Friends, Uno, Viewmaster, and Wishbone. 
If I didn't know any better, I'd say Mattel was preparing to launch a streaming service. Or a dark universe. Or both. Dark Universe Plus. Oh shit, wait, is that a curse? Did I just do a curse? Did I? It took five weeks for Barbie to become the highest grossing film ever in Ireland. It's the highest grossing film in Warner Brothers history in 43 countries. Now I know I've spent the better part of this year donking on Warner Brothers for their gross mismanagement of a 100 year old business. The lesson absolutely every movie studio should be learning is always bet on Greta Gerwig to deliver huge, thoughtful explorations of life. One toy had a mega successful film straight from the poster couple of weird, lovely indie cinema. And now every toy that has ever existed has a movie in development. Disney is still trying to make ride cinema a thing, and my head is just really starting to hurt. I think it's okay and awesome to take large cultural touchstones and make thoughtful reflections of what it feels like to be a woman in the world right now. Barbie is a special, one-of-a-kind toy. She has been inspirational, a poster child for body dysmorphia, a president, a scientist, and a window into another world for children to escape the callousness of their own sometimes. What isn't Barbie is a simpler question. Dear Toy Companies Starting Movie Studios This result will not be replicated. Sometimes I just think studio executives walk up and down the aisles of stores picking up boxes of Booberry Crunch and saying, Is this the next cinematic universe? <laughs> Applause. Give this man another yacht! I am simply hoping we tap brakes and think with hesitancy about instantly growing a film studio with 30 projects in the bong out of one success that we both know you won't spend the money to replicate again. Was that too, was that too on the nose? Film crit. Blech. Machine efficiency sands the sharpness away. Barbie is incredible, a home run that may finally come to land on Saturn. A lot of people played with a toy and brought their own experiences to what cannot be denied is a success on the size of the Avengers. This movie puts the spotlight directly onto the woman that reshaped an entire company by recognizing a hole in the American toy market that had a massive effect for more than 60 years. The focus of this movie should be on Ruth. And to a lesser extent, obviously, Bill Lilly dolls uh, deserve a footnote, at least for cleanly being the inspiration to try and build a market for a 12-inch doll in America. But I understand all of that would never pass the studio notes when Mattel is the studio. I'll sum this up as cleanly as I can. Go see movies from filmmakers who have passion, for the source material and are trying to evolve the market and artistic space filmmaking exists in. I mean, not but a few weeks ago, Hollywood was still trying to make AI scripts a thing because the fight is never going to change. I saw the flash, you saw the flash. I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. Executives really think people were there for the toy product? and not the whip-smart dissection of American patriarchal exceptionalism through the lens of toy politics, or, you know, just be mad forever. Both, both are acceptable, I guess. This was impossible. Every time Greta has made a movie, it has landed on my fave five every single time. Just thought I'd get a quicker jump on this one, I guess. So at the end of the day, Barbie is magical, but it's also a warning? Last Night in Soho is a film directed by Edgar Wright and written by Edgar Wright and Christy Wilson Cairns. First real conversations about this film were in basements in Soho and very much not getting here. On the night of the Brexit vote, I sure bet that set a tone. I'd have gone full Dario Argento too. If you feel like you need more movies with Mikey in your life right now, 
I got good news for you. I'm revisiting Edgar Wright with a Last Night in Soho piece, and it's available on Nebula right now. If you're not familiar with Nebula, it's a creator-owned streaming service where you can watch all of Filmjoy's videos before they hit YouTube. And kind of hilariously, Last Night in Soho was blocked worldwide when we tried to upload this video to YouTube just to like test it. Uh, but the YouTube release next month will be quite edited, I guess is what I'm telling you. So if you want to watch the original video the way it was intended to be seen, you can watch it right now on Nebula. This holiday season, Nebula is offering a lifetime membership for $300 and you pay once and get access to Nebula for as long as both you and Nebula exist. Lifetime memberships help us raise capital for amazing creator-owned projects they wouldn't otherwise be able to make. You can even gift a lifetime membership to a friend or family member. And best of all, a lifetime membership goes against the worst parts of streaming services, price increases, and monthly fees. We're super excited to see Jesse Gender's Nebula original Identities, which is coming to Nebula in 2024. There's tons of original content like Broey Deschanel's Taboo on Screen. Lindsay Ellis' newest Vegas video is an absolute home run. If you're not ready to commit to us for life, you can also sign up for an annual membership for just $30 a year. Both links are in the description, so please check it out if you're looking for a great way to support Filmjoy and other creators like us. And before we go, we're also having a Black Friday, Cyber Monday, don't think about it. You know, we were moving across country again. So if you want to help us out, please go to our store at catawampus.inc or shop.filmjoy.tv. You can get t-shirts for $18, enamel pins for $5, the best tote bags for $15, and a free tumbler with a $40 purchase. Keep drinks very cold. The more we sell, the less we obviously have to move to California, so please head over to catawampus.inc and check it out. Also, if you're wondering why I look like such a cave troll in this video, it's because we haven't really been in the same place for more than three months, so you know. <sighs> Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.